Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the eight hour chart of silver, and you can see here I've drawn a couple lines in. Um, one is not the primary downtrend, but is uh, a modified downtrend line, and that's this line. And the reason I drew that line in is because it seems like we, we this was a false breakout and we're testing it to the lower side. So, uh, how accurate is this line that I've drawn here? Well, it's hard to say because you have these violent tests outside of it. But we do seem to be breaking down. We're at 1580 right now. Are we going to get that plunge? I'm not going to say final plunge because I've said that too many times. But are we going to get a plunge? And if we do, then that's going to be a fantastic buying opportunity. Now, the question is going to be, will there be anything left to buy? Well, I hope so. Uh, I checked Provident again. And after I had bought mine, and actually mine were JM Bullion, but after that I checked them again. Provident got in another thousand, those were gone. They got in another thousand now, and you can see they're at 990, 1243. So that's very interesting too, because you can see here, I, I, don't, if, I don't remember the video, but I think mine were 1204, um, something like that. And this is another thing that you see them do when we have spike lows is that they stop dropping the prices i mean they're supposed to be hedged and uh they're supposed to be protected in the in the futures markets but there's a lot of risk there so they may or may not be hedged we really don't know but we do see that the price is kind of stagnating here as uh, the price of silver drops so that might be the end, maybe not. We don't know where they're sourcing these from, but they're they're moving quite a few. So I want to look at eBay for a second. And the reason why is because I just happened to notice when I was going through, actually it was just yesterday I was going through and I actually saw, I always do searches for uh, the Lunar Series and how many there are. Let me make sure I'm logged in here. Yep. And I check them in a lot of ways. I check for most recent sales, but I also check for the amount of money spent. Now, I did find about five hits of this, probably a lot more, but the thing about eBay is they roll stuff off. You can't see it anymore. And the reason why this is important is because one of the arguments we hear a lot is that yes, your lunar coins are they gain quickly in value and they they do get a nice premium going on them but you can never move any volume so here's an example and i can't prove it to you because it's already gone but i did see five or more and they did all go for that 2000 price so we're talking about a case of 100 of the half ounce dragons and we were buying those for 1250 about the same thing we're paying for the goats right now um, and you can see now they're moving the cases at $2,000. There haven't been any recent ones, but there's definitely the ability to move volume. So, you know, if you happen to pick up a bunch of cases, you could have got them for $1,250, and now you're selling them for $2,000. Let's say you bought five cases for, say, $6,000, and now you're selling them for $10,000. So there's a $4,000 profit in two years, let's say, or even less. So there's a little bit of proof for you that you can actually move volume as well. Uh, it was interesting, the last interview I did on that, the Beyond Bitcoin interview or round table that we had, he asked me about the strategy with these Perth Lunar Coins, the semi newies and he said, and I mentioned some that had gone up quite a bit, and he said, wow, I'd be really tempted to sell them and buy junk silver. And that is the temptation. And I think some, some of the members are doing that. But then again, we don't know how high these are going to go. Some of the ones like the rabbits and the mouse, some of these half ounce coins are 50, 60, 70, 80 dollars. So um, I haven't, I can just tell you personally, I have never pulled the trigger on turning around and selling them, partly because I don't want to deal with any tax consequences, but also because I don't think this run-up is anywhere near over. I think that these Lunar Series coins have such a huge potential 
that a double in two years is really nothing. It's it, it's nothing to compared to what can happen. So that's what I've done. I'm not sure what the members have done, but even the members who have uh, bought boxes of these for the twelve thirteen dollar price, turned around and sold them for twenty. Uh, they've done very well and got a lot more silver. So either way you play it, you're doing great. Now, let's look at the story of the night. I wanted to dig deeply into this one. This is a story that was on Zero Hedge. And this is a, a index that a lot of people cite. This is the GSCI. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, you have two major commodities indices. You have the, uh, the COMEX uh, I don't remember the, the name of that one. And then the alternative one you have here is the GSCI. And uh, this is about the GSCI Industrial Metals Index. So the GSCI is actually broken down into all the commodities. And we're going to look at the breakdowns here. That's where it's going to become really interesting. But let's read this story. This is from Dana Lyons. Uh, on March 5th, we noted that the S&P GSCI Industrial Metals Index was, quote, hanging on the precipice of a major long-term support level. At the time, the global deflationary spiral was reaching its nadir as all matters of commodities and pricing metrics were reaching multi-year lows. Not coincidentally, the U.S. dollar was soaring at the time to new 12-year highs. The concern with the industrial metals space threatening to break down was the inherent message vis-a-vis the global economic outlook. As we stated in the March post, it makes sense that pricing of industrial metals like aluminum, copper, nickel, zinc, etc. would make for a decent barometer of economic strength. These metals go into the manufacturing of myriad of products, thus their pricing, i.e. a sign of the level of demand for these metals, is a tip off to the level of global economic demand present. The failure of the industrial metals complex to hold key support would appear to us to bode ill for the global economic outlook. The key support level threatening to give way was the 61.8% Fibonacci retracement near 307 of the rally from 2009 to 2011 to which the index had recently dropped. That level at the time had held for several days confirming its relevance and perhaps significance as a support level. We had seen the price of crude oil as well as the comprehensive CRB commodity index, that's the index I was referring to, I'm sorry, the CRB, Commodity index break their own such 61.8% Fibonacci levels en route to major collapses. However, we also saw copper hold its similar level, so it appeared that the industrial metals could go either way. Considering the lack of any bounce at all off the 61.8% level, the chart had the looks of a continuation pattern. Thus, our suspicions were that the index would eventually break down. Well, our suspicions were correct for one day on March 18th, and it goes on. So... I'm not going to read the rest of this because it's um, kind of an Elliott Wave thing. I don't really agree with that. But the main point here is that this GSCI, Goldman Sachs Commodity Index, Industrial Metals Index, is breaking down. Now, I wanted to take you to the Wikipedia entry for the GSCI. And this is important because the first thing you want to look at is the components and weights. That's the thing you're going to ask first thing off. And I pulled up a whole bunch of stuff when I was researching this. I pulled up PDFs that were 150 pages, and I just had a simple question. What is the weighting? I don't really care all about these complex metrics. I want to know what weighting you're giving each of these commodities. Well, this chart is the best because this not only gives you the separate breakdown in the different indices, but it also gives you the total breakdown of the entire index. So the entire index is the GSC, uh, S&P GSCI index. Now, you can see right off the bat the incredible uh, overweighting of energy in this index. That's going to be the first thing that stands out when you look at it. So when you look at the overall commodities index, the GSCI, it is 80% energy, okay? And then industrial metals are 6%. Precious metals are only 2%. Agriculture is 10% and livestock is 3%. So the first thing that's going to jump out at you, of course, is how overweighted it is for energy, but also 
that it actually has three times the weighting for industrial metals than it does for precious metals. Now, the next thing we want to look at here is in the precious metals, only less than 2% of the entire commodities index is precious metals. But now we see that among the precious metals, gold has a 1.58% weighting and silver has only a 0.23% weighting. Now, that is interesting just on its face because that is a six times difference. There's a 600% higher weighting for gold than there is for silver. And that would be something that you would think would be, okay, well, that might be representative of precious metals because that's representative of investment demand because of central bankers and things like that. But the thing that you would wonder about is why is silver only under the precious metals? Why isn't silver under industrial metals? Silver is one of the most important industrial metals, but it's not listed at all as an industrial metal. Gold is an industrial metal as well, but not nearly so much as silver. So if you hark back and think back to the FOFOA uh, video that I just did, where he's saying that when the collapse comes, silver is going to collapse to a 20,000 to one ratio to gold. And that's because the industrial demand is going to collapse. That's very interesting when we think about that. Not only are the precious metals underweighted, but the precious metals that are underweighted, silver is underweighted sixfold to gold. And silver is not listed as an industrial metal. So that ought to tell you right there, this index is rigged. It doesn't mean anything. Um, I can't tell you what the chart would be if this index were honest, if this were a real index that weighted things based upon their actual participation in the economy. But again, this is Goldman Sachs, so they're not going to tell you the truth. So let's dig further into this and go to the Kitco spot prices. I, this is something I go to a lot and it's very important. You should check it too. Keep in mind that we have a weighting in the industrial metals we get two plus percent for aluminum, almost 3% for copper, but we only get 0 0.3, 0 0.6, and 0.8 for lead, nickel, and zinc. So lead, nickel, and zinc combined aren't weighted as much as either copper or aluminum. So let's go and revisit these. Again, what I do when I'm visiting these charts is I look at the metal and go to the five year chart that's the one we all want to look at first is the five-year chart this is aluminum and this is the warehouse stocks levels so on a five-year you can see that aluminum has the stocks have dropped dramatically so of course we're going to try to correlate the stocks with the price now aluminum is not a metal that is going to be correlated at all with the precious metals you don't mine aluminum in the same mine that you mine gold and silver. The two most highly correlated are going to be copper and zinc, and then lead's going to come in third. We've covered that before. So on our aluminum stocks, you can see that we've been falling since 2013. We want to go and check the aluminum price. And we can see the five-year aluminum price. We're going into new lows. So that makes sense. Aluminum is dropping in the warehouse stocks are dropping. Um, the spot price is still dropping, but at some point we can expect a turnaround in this. Now let's look at copper. That's what they call Dr. Copper. Here is the five-year copper spot price. And you can see that copper is indeed going into new lows. And here's the five-year warehouse stock. So we, we don't have a shortage of copper, but again, we don't have a massive uh, amount of copper. So those are kind of inconclusive. Let's look at lead and the five-year lead spot price. You can see it looks like lead is going to be testing new lows. And here's the lead stock. So you can see that the lead stock is actually dipping to new lows. 
here's nickel. Now nickel is important because as I pointed out before, nickels are something that you can buy that are a, a, a sure thing investment because you can always sell them for a nickel, but they may end up being worth a lot more than a nickel. You can see the nickel price is, is dropping. There was a point there back here in 2011 when a nickel was worth about eight or nine cents a piece. You can see it's dropped dramatically from there. So you have to go to coinflation.com and check those. Here are the nickel stocks. You can see that the nickel stocks are absolutely through the roof. Now, this is one of those outliers, one of those anomalies. You're going to have to ask, why would the nickel stocks be absolutely through the roof uh, while the nickel price is continuing to fall? Um, that's something that is hard to explain, and you have to think about industrial metals and precious metals at the same time. This is a relationship that's very difficult to understand because you have to understand whether a mine is a primary precious metal mine or whether the mine is a industrial metal mine. Why are they mining? Well, that's a hard question to ask answer because we don't really know why they're mining. Uh, some of them are mining their companies right into bankruptcy. A lot of these companies, they'd be better off to just take their working capital, put it into an investment and wait until prices recover. But that's not how things work. And we know the boards are stacked. So these things are hard to explain. The last one is zinc. That's also fairly highly correlated with the precious metals. And you can see here the five year zinc chart, chart is just pretty much sideways. So let's look at the zinc stock. So we're kind of going lower. You can see we had, what is that, 12 million or 1.2 million. We're all the way down to um, 400,000. So that's about a two thirds decrease in the warehouse stocks of zinc. So looking at these, there it's kind of inconclusive. You can't really draw a conclusion at this point um, it's it's strange that you have the warehouse levels of certain of these metals very, very high. Some of them very, very low. The prices are kind of sideways. What is going on? Well, I can't tell you exactly what's going on, but I can tell you that they're not real markets anymore because the government, the Fed, and the bullion banks are interfering in these markets. And that's why you have these strange anomalies. You have companies that are going bankrupt as they mine precious metals. You, you have no more primary silver mines or virtually no more primary silver mines. You have this bizarre weighting of silver at only one sixth the value of gold in the index. And yet silver is far more of an important industrial commodity and it's not listed at all as an industrial metal. But that's not surprising because it's Goldman Sachs commodity index. So. The bottom line in all this is that silver is manipulated, gold is manipulated, not quite to the same extent as silver, but these manipulations cause all kinds of strange price anomalies and it affects the industrial metals, it affects the precious metals, it affects the physical prices, it also affects the paper prices and the fake paper investments like SLV and GLD. And it causes huge changes that wouldn't normally be there. And it causes the bankruptcy of a large number of mining companies because the feds are interfering in mining. They're interfering in all of this and we don't have free markets anymore. So the upshot of all of this is that uh, silver is not only underweighted uh, the precious metals are not only underweighted in the commodities index, but silver is underweighted six times in the precious metals index. And that tells you that they do not want the price of silver to affect the index one way or the other. Now, that's a good thing in a way, because when, and I believe it's when, not if, when silver makes a significant price move to the upside, it's not going to re be reflected in these indices. Uh, silver could go to $100 and you wouldn't even see a blip on the radar screen in that index. And I think that's why it's designed that way. Ultimately, it's going there. 
we have to pick up as much physical as we can. If we get this rollover to new lows, then that's going to be a fantastic time probably to pick up the rest of those half ounce goats. And if those run out, the next one's going to be the two ounce goats at about 43 bucks. And we'll talk to you next time.